hi there. I'm, I'm Adam Bowen, um, founder of AQL, and, and I'm pleased to welcome you to um, UK Advisory Board Chair, Ross Singleton, uh, who I have the pleasure to work alongside on the same board, uh, and also Happy Ways Chief Commercial Officer, Rob State, whose cool tech I use probably on almost a daily basis. Um, we're here to discuss uh, very broadly connectivity for good, and that's how the right digital infrastructure will have a continuous positive impact on the economy, environment, and, and also what that right digital infrastructure is. Um, also to discuss uh, new and up and coming technologies uh, that will further better connectivity and some of the inspiring projects that are using the latest communications tech for good. Um, so I'm going to ask Roz and Rob to introduce themselves and their companies or organisations, starting with Roz. Thank you. Um, it occurs to me you should have picked people with two slightly more different sounding first names. Uh, <laughs> it be easier. Um, yeah, so I'm Ros Singleton. I'm the chair of the UK 5G Advisory Board. UK 5G is a, a body that DCMS set up a couple of years ago to help foster and develop the ecosystem around 5G in the UK, uh, particularly with a view to, uh, let's say, non-consumer applications. So we do inc include consumer applications as well. With that in mind, we have a number of working groups, actually one of which Adam is co-chair of, uh, which is the Test Beds and Trials Group, which is, is about actually helping our Test Beds and Trials get the most out of uh, their funding and the most out of uh, actually their potential. Uh, we have a number of others as well around international, uh, local enterprise partnerships, connected places, uh, security, um, and the list goes on. Um, but what I would say is that we are specifically here to make sure that that ecosystem develops on the supply side and the demand side in as diverse a way as possible. And recently we've uh, published the supply directory, uh, which is uh, to try and help people who are setting up consortia or looking for 5G solutions to actually understand who it is and might be the best person to talk to without actually having to be a radio engineer or some other expert in, you know, whatever level of G's networking it is. And um, so hopefully that's taking off and uh, UK5G, I should add as my plug, free to join, UK5G.org. Uh, it's full of useful information. Hi, so Rob State, Chief Commercial Officer at Happy Way. Um, and at Happy Way, our work is about uh, using smart city technology to deliver improvements to curbside access, uh, as we call it, um, and to parking. Um, so we address a, a really significant contributor to CO2 in cities. Um, drivers, it is estimated, spend on average around 10 minutes of every journey uh, looking for availability, um, which is one of the biggest factors causing congestion, uh, in cities today and uh, and causing detriment to our air quality. So we're working on solutions which help to manage that and address that by making it easier for cities to manage uh, their curbside assets and their parking uh, and making it easier for drivers to find parking, to find out if it's available uh, and, and then to pay for it. So we do that in the form of uh, apps like the Appy Parking app, but we also provide uh, data and access to that data for businesses whose fleets are, are accessing the curbside and, and looking to make deliveries every day and uh, uh, and on our busiest streets in cities. So we believe that it's a really important aspect uh, within any smart city uh, and that's why I'm here today. Just a few words about me. Um, I'm kind of known in the industry as the internet plumber. Uh, so I've co-founded a, a couple of internet exchanges. Um, that's all about local data routing, um, converging networks, matching eyeball networks with content. Uh, and uh, my day job uh, is uh, a telco I founded, um, which was built around how to enable smart companies and developers interface with communications and get to market quicker and to scale. So we're kind of the, the back end comms engine for big lumps of the NHS, many banks, um, some really, really hyperscale taxi companies whose name I can't mention, um, and, um, and some uh, smartphone manufacturers. So we sit in the background and we just make stuff work. And that's our job is to kind of be that, that uh, 
uh, low-lying engineering telecoms layer that nobody else wants to do, uh, but is a kind of a necessary evil um, to get uh, from the smart platform stuff, um, for example, the stuff that Appyway does, uh, to the end user. So I guess kick off with a few questions. How do you think the right digital infrastructure will have a continuous positive impact on the economy and or environment or society? Um, one, what kind of technology um, do you think we should be getting excited about and also in which verticals? And to start off with you, Ross. Oh, uh, okay. That's, that's a really broad question, I'm going to say. I promise you broad questions. <laughs> which scope as you want. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know. I'm quite, I'm quite excited actually about the, the convergence of, of a number of technologies. Uh, I mean, Neil and Adam as well from, from UK 5G is much as we're around 5G, we're not 5G to the exclusion of all others. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very um, multi-theistic universe that we live in. And then obviously 5G needs technology to actually make use of it or else it's, you know, it's just something really clever uh, that everybody can marvel at in a museum one day. You know, if it's not actually practically useful, it doesn't have purpose. And so it sits alongside a lot of other technologies um, that require the particular, uh, I suppose, talents it has, like, like low latency um, and a bit more security. Um, but equally, you know, there are other things like Wi-Fi 6 coming along that sit alongside that, that are equally complementary. I think one of the key things for me is 4G, 3G a little bit, but 4G particularly brought along the idea of a wireless life. You know, that and, and a bit more ubiquitous, decent quality broadband um, across the country with Wi-Fi routers becoming cheaper, you know, that's, there's a wireless life. We all have a device on our personal, most people do, right? I mean, and, more, and more freedom and more working on our own terms, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Except for, actually, it doesn't work for work, depending on what you do for work. You know, if you only need a bit of email or whatever, it's fine. But actually, if, if you work in, in the care system or in HS or in a factory or, or in lots of other places, actually, these devices are not supportive of that and are not useful. And I see... You know, some of the things we can start to think about with, with 5G, with some of the other technologies coming along with AI, um, with actually the way that apps are starting to become much, much more interoperable with the way there are, there's a more automatic, if you like, exposing of APIs, all those sorts of things that enable plumbers like yourself, Adam, to start to glue bits of technology together to, to create a, a best of functionality rather than necessarily a best of suite or a best of breed or any of those things to actually just pick and choose functionality from a bunch of providers who really know what they're doing. You know, the advent of software as a service for me has been nothing short of, you know, brilliant for businesses because, you know, if you run an HR system, unless you're an HR company, it's not a differentiator. Why, why do you want to go and spend loads of money having something, you know, dealt with by loads of expensive consultants? And, and I see that sort of moving along almost to the point where you end up in a, a boutique place where you can pick and choose combinations of either apps or functionalities or APIs to suit how you want to run your business. And that ultimately will enable the person who has to go and check on somebody in their home and feed them, clothe them, dress them, order new equipment for them, uh, you know, make sure their prescriptions arrive, make sure they're taking the medication. It will enable them to do all those things, hopefully in a much more automated way, which will free up more people for frontline care rather than backline administration, for example. A few themes coming through there, aren't there, about connected, uh, networks and, and one of them being the, the consistency of a um, of high quality access so that you can begin to de depend on it and um, it, you know in large organizations in particular access being locked down and, and not enabled it becomes problematic so uh, overcoming that as a hurdle the consistency of that high quality access is uh, is going to be critical it's going to be crucial to switch on the benefits the environmental and the business benefits um, that you mentioned um, because pretty much everything uh, in technology all the developments all the exciting things that we can see in smart cities in particular they're all they all rely on it and they're underpinned um, by connectivity through 5g through uh, Wi-Fi networks, whether they be Wi-Fi 6 or, or otherwise, being available and being available everywhere. Um, and then the other aspect is um, the importance of all that connectivity being shared and open, um, but also the, the information that we get out of it, the, the, the importance of data and the importance of open data standards um, so that we can get the, the health and the environmental benefits 
um, and so that we can progress uh, w without being hindered by competitive instincts and uh, and, and competitive prote protectionist behaviours. Um, and that kind of begins by putting the connectivity in place, doesn't it? Which, uh, which I think is is kind of where we're at as a, an industry, just waiting for uh, for five G to to scale up to the extent that we can release the solutions. I'm sure we all remember um, when the internet used to break all the time, uh, when when dial up used to fail, um, when websites used to go down all the time, uh, when your phone didn't connect, and and now it's something that we just we take for granted as this ubiquitous layer that just works. And we have quite a, we have, have quite a severe emotional response when it doesn't. It's a bit like when a car breaks down. Uh, you expected cars to break down in the 70s. You don't expect cars to break down now. They're just meant to work. And I think that there is uh, sort of analogous to that, that open data layer and that interoperability between systems so that you can just pick and choose, as you say, Roz, um, uh, between systems to build something that is one seamless uh, solution for you or for society or for your business. I think that that's also starting to happen within connectivity. So some of, for example, the exciting interoperability standards within, uh, within 5G around how you can uh, create a, a particular class or priority of traffic. Um, you could create a particular connection that can be used by um, a film crew, and it'll give a particular, a particular um, uh, priority to media, or you could have um, a telemetry and, and um, a coordination class for autonomous vehicles um, that prioritizes how they flow in and around cities and how they don't bump into each other. And you can have another class for how you deliver Netflix or other streaming media uh, to the people in those cars. And that's going to become something that then works across multiple networks seamlessly. Uh, so in the same way as you have those seamless open access services and aggregators of those seamless open access services in terms of data and APIs, um, I think we'll also have that uh, in terms of network. And we won't really talk about network providers, we'll, we'll just talk about a connection. Uh, and that, that's going to be, uh, again, not focusing on the, um, the gubbins of the technology um, or the, the solution waiting for the problem. Um, we'll, we'll be just using it as a tool uh, and then we'll move on to the next thing, um, which may be AI, for example. What kind of projects um, have you seen that are really using uh, the latest technologies and why do you feel that these projects are good uh, how how do you th how do you think they're going to be beneficial and scalable for, so for society? And this one this, this one's to you, Rob, first. I mean, the first thing I'd, I'd highlight because it's it's close to home. It's a, <clears throat> a project that that we're involved in is seeing a, a, a lot of advances in video analytics. Um, now, you know, we've had solutions uh, for image analytics and, and getting it in intelligence from static cameras for a long time now you know that, mm. that kind of data has been streamed and um, used to death but it, it tends to be single use use cases um, but what better connectivity in 5g gives us is the ability to um, to actually take that to moving cameras and to to cover a, a much uh, greater expanse uh, of cities and, uh, and so that, that's, that's going to deliver huge benefits and, and huge advances, whether it be uh, public health and safety concerns, you know, think the current environment, spotting groups of more than six, um, or you know, violent altercations, whatever it might be. It sounds all well, Ian. It does, yeah. <laughs> but, but through to more helpful um, and, and more acceptable perhaps um, things like like maintenance and detection of, of obstacles, of broken signs, rubbish detection, fly tipping, improvements to the, the public realm and, and to neighbourhoods. Um, and then there's, there's the business interest in, in that side as well, the behavioural analytics that we can get from uh, live roving uh, videos. Um, and marketing people will kill for that kind of data, you know, where people are shopping, what they're interested in, um, or indeed in our case, where to find available parking 
you know, and, and there are knock on benefits for that in, in reducing congestion. Um, but I'm, uh, we're working with a couple of companies and, and we're seeing much more technology that's uh, that's using this connectivity to establish live surveys as well. Um, so that can be constantly updating changes to the road network, to traffic. It can be providing intelligence on uh, last meter information. So you know, if you are uh, a, a delivery firm, letting you know what the curb height is, uh, where they're headed, or is there anything in the way? Is there illegal parking? Can they access that? last meter that last meter stopping point um, and that as well will have a, a big impact and, and will become uh, a must-have for many businesses and, and many authorities no i mean, that, I mean that's, that's really exciting but you can almost use that that technology to kind of see around corners you could probably see uh using third party cameras if a child's about to step out onto the road that you can't see yet but somebody else's camera can exactly and it, uh, Happy way we, we talk about going through phases with this technology first you digitize it then you connect and optimize it and we're very much still in that connect and optimize phase aren't we but um, as you connect more and more vehicles and, and give them get them to a, a degree where you can rely upon uh, the accuracy of the information um, then driverless and or, or, or autonomous vehicles uh, can start to have that built-in uh, intelligence that there is a there is something to be aware of around the corner and uh, and really deliver those safety benefits. No, no, for sure. And, and for me, the thing that makes me excited as as the internet exchange geek is to make all this stuff work. We've got to make sure that we optimise the routing of the traffic so that it all stays local and stays within the city. So um, Ros and I are very much in, involved in sort of interfacing with the, the, the standards organizations around 5G. And, and one of the things that is starting to now seep into, into the standards is, is that local routing and that edge computing of all of that data. Uh, and so now the, 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 the technology is starting to find the solutions and unlock um, the kinds of challenges and opportunities that you're, you're starting to see there. And so same, same, same thing over to you, Roz. I'm quite lucky. I mean, one of my uh, sort of side gigs, I suppose, is um, I'm, a, I'm an angel investor. And, and so I do quite a lot of work with, with young entrepreneurs. And, and we focus particularly on business, tech businesses with at least one female founder. Um, and I've seen all sorts of amazing things, uh, you know, from I've been investing in blockchain business for some years, which is actually about transparency. Uh, from actually very low tech environments where you might be fishing somewhere in the world, for example, and you can use something as simple as SMS to start a supply chain that's highly visible. It goes all the way to, you know, your tin of tuna in the co-op um, and tells you exactly where it's been all the way through or tells you where your fancy pants handbag has come from or, you know, whatever it happens to be. There's a load of those sorts of applications I see. But I also see things uh, like... Um, why we call low tech stuff, but, but the ability to print and manufacture materials that allow you to create waterless toilets for use in areas where there is a lot less hygiene. Um, and you know, stuff like that is, is kind of fascinating to me because those things that, that reduce disease um, and increase people's chances of, of living well and living healthily actually are, are a really key underlying component of economic success, right? If your population keeps falling out and dying, they can't be generating GDP or value or happiness or however you measure the success of your nation um, you know and, and they'll tend to be more unhappy and more easy to you know uh, cow and treat in certain ways so you know, there's a lot of stuff like that I see which is quite basic and then mm. you know you move all the way along some amazing engineers who are doing things like some really deep stitching together of, of drone photography which is a lot harder than it sounds lots of people sort of do it but actually to do it properly and then be able to identify differences with really precise pinpointing um, you know, it's fascinating. If you want to increase offshore wind farms, if you want to run really efficient nuclear power stations, if you want to, I don't know, monitor almost any form of building in terms of, you know, its heat emissions, in terms of whether it's falling apart, if you want to inspect property without actually sending 18 people into a potentially unsafe environment, you know, all those sorts of things, you can do it with these sorts of technology almost in real time. Um, and it will become much more effective. So I think you know, for me, I'm, I'm not always at the cutting edge, you know, like, like you guys, but, but I see a lot of things where we are stitching together lots of different bits of technology. Um, 
in a way that actually enables us to make life hopefully healthier and safer for lots of people and, and you know more productive as well no, it, it, it sounds it sounds like you you focus on on the right technology for the right environment um, so I guess it's not necessarily always about 5G, it's about what's applicable to the, the situation and solves the problem for the, the biggest audience. I, I mean, you know, if you look at the test beds and trials, Adam, then, you know, we've got all sorts of things from monitoring trees, you know, in Sherwood Forest to the sort of factory of the future stuff and, you know, all sorts of bits in between. So everything from, you know, sharing spectrum in rural areas, which is really critical and interesting, has actually created a brand new mobile operator, effectively. Um, out of it again um, to you know just making sure that there is rural access and none of these things necessarily require 5G but what they require is is impetus and time and focus from a group of people which invariably requires funding and I think that's one of the critical things that we need to think of around both tech for good and innovation you know, one of the things I see with tech for good is sometimes it struggles for funding um, and, you know, I think at the moment, particularly because people are particularly focused a lot of things that were otherwise maybe perceived as nice to have, and I'd put tech for good for some people in that sort of category, fall a little bit by the wayside. And so I have a bit of a concern that, you know, various businesses actually have perfectly viable business models, but maybe that don't look quite as, you know, on point as far as profit goes, might, might lose a little bit in funding. No, I think, I think you've, you've hit on something that's, there's, there's slightly off the connectivity for good side, but it's re really important here, which, which is that that's access to seed funding and, and mentorship uh, around, around startups. Uh, about five years ago, um, because when I started um, 20 odd years ago, um, the idea of a, a seed investor, I, I had no idea where to go. So about five years ago, I, I formed a company called North Invest, and, and we invest in tech for good, cyber, health tech, well, most tech is tech for good in one sort, one sort, one kind or another, because we're tr always trying to solve some kind of societal problem statement. That's that's just in our nature. But the, that access to seed funding um, to solve those societal problems is a really hard thing to find. And and what we're seeing now, uh, and it's really heartening, is um, is entrepreneurs solving societal problems, but also wanting to give something back as well. And so, for example, you know, Rob, you were, you were saying that uh, you're also sharing your data um, uh, in other ways um, to, to, to help third parties. And I think there's a, there's, a, there's a big piece here where we're seeing businesses that are being built that are also using the raw material for their business to act as a catalyst for change uh, and start other businesses as well. What part do you think government should play in supporting good di digital infrastructure? Uh, a really simple message if you were to do an elevator pitch. Uh, well, I've said this publicly more than once. Um, I think that the, um, well, that I think there are, there are a couple of things the government needs to do. One is actually look at um, the underpinning infrastructure in a more holistic way. Um, so it, particularly in terms of, you know, fiber and wireless um, and, and also in terms of the innovation support environment, all those things need a good think about and a good rationalize over actually is what we aim for with these, they all start with the best intent, is what we aim for with these still actually where they're pointed at and where we're all headed, you know, whether it's digging holes in the ground for fiber or whether it's, you know, something that a catapult or an innovation center might do. And, you know, how can we make sure that those things are on track and if you like, sharing an agenda and a purpose and making sure that we're not duplicating effort everywhere those would be those would be the key things asked for i think there's plenty of money there there are literally billions going into innovation and research in the uk it's just making sure it's all understood pointing in the right direction and removing as much duplication as possible i think a lot of what we've talked about today it's you know technology is merging making the best of connectivity the the truth is that a lot of the solutions are ready to go what's lagging is that consistency of the of the connectivity uh, once we've got that that in place and you can start to launch things that will generate consumer consumer adoption then it, it'll take off it, it it'll explode all, all these technical innovations that we're talking about will will happen very quickly um, you know, so to take 5G as a case in point, 
um, it, it's the millimeter wave frequencies mean that uh, you need a much denser network of, of masts and cells, particularly in cities, um, because 5G will get blocked by trees and other objects, as you know. Um, so really that needs to be driven by getting the, the, the equipment providers and the network operators to cooperate. And that can only really done, be done and achieved by local authorities and, and by government. So and local authorities find themselves uh, in, in the spotlight uh, for 5G infrastructure as a result. Um, so I think that's, that's the one thing that government can be driving is, is the co cooperation across competitors, across, um, across that vertical um, to, to get the, the connectivity and the infrastructure consistent uh, and in place as quickly as possible. No, no, no. hear you 100%. The, the idea of having four different masts in the same field all doing the same job on different frequencies, uh, when you start to bring that into the city in terms of sort of pico cells, femto cells, and you've got lots of different things stuck on the sides of buildings, again, it, it makes no sense. Um, we, we, need, we need to compete anywhere necessary and collaborate wherever possible. Um, and neutral host infrastructure, I, I, I agree, it's, it's, a, it's a key part of that. Um, so we'll, we'll end on that. Um, and I'd like to say um, again, uh, thanks to Robin Ross, so I shall. So thanks once again, and a great weekend to you both.